Hey guys, welcome back to the Be Leave, Be Real, Be Bold podcast. I'm honored to be joined from Vancouver, Canada, Ms. Shanna Chow. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm very uh, excited to be here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for joining me. What does what the current dating world look like from your lens up there? From my lens up here, um, a lot of my clients are doing online dating. Um, a lot of people are kind of like a bit in a rut, I would say, with the online world because it's kind of hard to go that much further when you haven't met in person if you're just doing the initial talking. Um, another side of it is a lot of my clients that are in relationships are experiencing a little bit more conflict with the social distancing with their partners and, and all of that jazz. So it's, it's a little bit, it's two different sides to it, I see. And do the people that are in a relationship currently, did they choose to shelter in place or are they having a problem with uh, social distancing because they can't spend time together? No, I think one of the main issues that I have been dealing with is people that are in long-term relationships that are social distancing with their significant other. So usually you're used to, you know, seeing, seeing each other maybe a couple hours in the evening or in the morning on the weekends and you really cherish that time together, which is great. But then, you know, you're seeing them 24 hours a day and you're like, wow, all right. <laughs> so you get a little bit too much. So that kind of behavior and also kind of um, like disputes or, you know, fights about things you usually wouldn't fight about. Yeah. Right. So the little things are coming up for them and they're kind of yes. uh, stepping on each other's toes a little bit because. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you know what? It's actually a really good learning curve for relationships, patience. You know, it's kind of like you're going through this together. When you come out of it, come out of it together, you're going to be that much stronger. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Too much of a good thing when you're spending 24 seven with somebody. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't have a social outlet like getting together with friends or going to see family or a uh, date night out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we usually do have those social outlets, right? So what I say to a lot of my clients is, you know, if you can leave your house, go for a walk, go for, you know, a jog, do th take the dog for a walk, do things separate when you can, you know, so you don't have to be cooped up together all the time, make an agenda, make a plan, make a schedule so that you're not always together and you can have time apart still with living with each other 24 hours a day, basically. That's right. And it could be said um, when we're not sheltering in place together that that would be true as well, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes. It's all, you need to have your me time, alone time in any healthy relationship, for sure. Mm -hmm. I was contemplating that a little bit before we jumped on today that like, um, although the topic of conversation is coronavirus and quarantine and shelter in place right now, mm -hmm. the same principles for a healthy relationship still apply when we don't have a pandemic, right? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's just, it's just very micro right now, right? It's just very close and you're having to do it on a different scale, but large scale, you should have your own separate time together as a part. You should have your own hobbies, your own wants, your own needs, your own lives, because that's what makes the time together so much more valuable and, and special. And, you know, you value that somebody has their own independence within a relationship, having your own independence within a relationship, I believe makes a really strong relationship, right? Mm -hmm, because you're not diving completely all into each other's world. Exactly. You're dependent on each other for the, you know, the right reasons, right? For the relationship reasons, but having your own passions, your own desires, your own hobbies, your own, even your own friend groups, your own social circles, that's very important in a relationship. Yeah. And you can speak to that a lot because you're an adventurous person professionally and personally, like acting yes. and writing and, mm -hmm. uh, how is it that you got into dating and relationship coaching? Sure. So it might be a bit of a long winded story. Um, <laughs> I, I, got the time. Uh, I, all right. Okay. Let's do this. I grew up um, behind the scenes in the motion picture industry. So my dad is, well, now he's a retired prop master. So he'd worked on a lot of big Hollywood blockbusters around the world uh, with his film crew. So I would travel as a young kid and I would see him on sets and I really fell in love with the whole acting filmmaking world. So when I was, um, when I was a kid and into my teenage years, I did acting, I did drama in school, I did um, modeling, a lot of, I did swimmer modeling, fitness modeling, acting work in my early 20s. Um, however, unfortunately for me, I developed a sense of eating disorders and a sense of body image issues 
that, you know, were really hard to deal with. You're getting judged constantly on your appearance, the way you look, um, more so than what you're bringing to the table in terms of, you know, your intelligence level for some, sometimes, right? So I decided to go um, and further my education. I went to university and got my degree in social sciences from Simon Fraser University. I also got certified as a personal trainer through NSAM uh, Academy. And from there, I worked in the provincial government helping women, um, well, families, low social economic families, but also women, majority, um, majority of women, a lot of them fleeing domestic abuse. I did that for about four years. And then from there, I decided, you know what, I really want to help women independently because in government, it's great. You can help women, but you're also very um, limited on how much you can help somebody. It's all, you know, there's legislation. You can't go up and above. You ought to go through the guidelines and that's fine, but it, it's really hard to not take that home when you see people suffer and you can't do anything more for them. So that was really hard for me. So I went and I got certified as a life coach. And then from there, I wanted to create my own, my own business, uh, coaching business, dating relationship coaching business for women. I was creating that, working with clients. And ironically for me, when I turned uh, 30 a couple of years ago, I came out of my own relationship breakup. So I was with somebody for about four years. It was a very, very challenging breakup and I found myself single. So for me, I feel like sometimes women, when they go through relationship breakups, you either are like, yeah, I'm single, woo. Or you're like, I am single and I'm devastated. And I was, uh, I am single and I'm devastated. Um, a lot of my friends were either married in long-term relationships, had children, and I felt really alone. So for me, I couldn't really show up for my clients. I had to take some time to myself to heal. And I put the business on hold for a couple of years, did other forms of employment. And then within the last eight months, I really recreated the business, restarted it. And I'm just really ready right now to serve women dating or in relationships with conflicts. Wow. That, I think that's why your story resonated with me so much when we connected over Instagram, I believe is how we got yeah. introduced. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, I tell this story occasionally on the podcast, but I went through my own breakup mm -hmm. and I relate to that rebirth and that growth period that happens after a relationship, as long as we don't jump into the next one. Exactly. Yeah. So how did you, how did you turn that devastation into a positive life changing event? Well, for me, I feel like, I feel like when any, anyone goes through a breakup, um, you know, a long-term, short-term, it doesn't really necessarily matter. It matters how much the person meant to you and what you lost and, and having to restart your life. Right. So I feel like everybody always wants like a magic button or a magic, you know, recipe or how am I going to feel better tomorrow or the next day? And my advice for all my clients is it takes time. You need to take time to actually heal and, you know, spend the time to actually self-reflect. If you go into the dating scene right away, it's not going to be good for you. It's not going to be good for the person you're dating. It's not really fair to them, is it either, <laughs> to be honest. And I found myself doing that at times where I was like, okay, maybe I should go out. I should date. And I did. And it wasn't serving me. It wasn't serving the people I was dating because I wasn't over the relationship per se. And I wasn't healed. Um, an outlet for me, which is what I do is I'm also a writer. I have two books that I published, one in 2017 called Love Gone Savage, the second one in 2019 called I Tried to Write Love Poems. And I Tried to Write Love Poems, in a sense, is a collection of poetry and motivational writing that helped me express myself over the last two years. And it's dedicated to any woman going through the unrelenting pain of a heartbreak. Um, so that is one of the outlets that I use to really ground myself and get to a place where I was ready to then redate. Mm -hmm. I can resonate that with that a lot. Um, went through a breakup in early December, 2017. And mm -hmm. then in 2018, January, I started writing my memoir. And it, oh, was wow. a, it was a story of how my personal training career came from um, 20 years of battling anxiety and depression. So wow. it was part of my therapeutic process, just like mm -hmm. your uh, love poems book was yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. I, I flew through it. It only took me about four months to actually write it. Yeah. Um, compiled a bunch of blog posts and then filled in the rest with my story. Mm -hmm. And when I finished that, it was really just kind of like this opportunity for me to look at the patterns that led up to my career were also the same patterns that 
caused the relationship to end in the first place. Wow. So that's when the podcast started. This idea okay. started kind of generating in my, in my mind and in my heart about like, instead of getting frustrated before I jump back into dating, let's mm-hmm. do something about it for me mm-hmm. or my eventual partner too. Wow. That's so interesting. And also like, did you find that it just, it's so amazing how fast the words come out when they need to, absolutely. when they need to, right. Yeah. It's like uh, people ask me like, how did you put together that book so fast? And I'm like, you know what? It wasn't work for me. It was, it was, I needed to, you know, I needed to express myself. I wanted to get it out there. And it's a, it's, it is a form of therapy in a way, right. Writing. Absolutely. For Whether sure. that's journaling and you never intend somebody to read it or yeah. <laughs> you write your memoir, which is a version of journaling and you still don't intend people to read it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. So what have you seen as like um, empowering you to help others through your own story? So through my own story, I really want women to feel like they're whole on their own. So for me, when I, like I said, when I got single when I was 30, I was devastated. I was pretty, I was pretty, you know, I was pretty upset because I was at a stage where I really wanted to start a family. I wanted to have that next stage in my life. And all my friends, you know, were married, had kids for the most part. I didn't really have any single girlfriends. And there's a lot of pressure on women that, you know, either from society or their own internal pressures or their culture, their friends, their family, whatever, that when you hit a certain age, you know, you need to have children or you need to settle down. Your biological clock is working for you. You need to like make that next step. And I found myself when I was semi-healed, which going on dates and really trying to push it, really trying to find someone and thinking, I'm like, I'm going to go on this date. I'm going to find this person that that's this. And it wasn't until I really just took a step back and realized, what are you doing? Like when you search for love, it's really not going to come to you, right? You're settling. You don't know what you want. You don't have your boundaries up. You're looking for something out there that, you know, you can't just magically create out of nothing. So what I want to help women with, I have a program that I launched a couple of weeks ago called Do You Boo. It's about taking a step back and doing the internal work and getting really clear on what you want and what you need. Don't settle for what you don't want because you feel pressure from society or yourself and you're a certain age who freaking cares how old you are. That, so basically that's what I want to instill in women is being whole on your own, uh, whether you're single and dating or in a relationship. And why is it that authentic love is so hard to find when you're trying to fill that void? I think it's hard to find because I think when you're trying to fill that void, women themselves sometimes aren't being authentic themselves because you're wanting to put yourself out there as an image that you're, you know, you're easygoing, you're this, you're that, because you want it so bad. And it's hard to essentially be your authentic self when you're looking for something, you're trying to grasp onto something that isn't naturally happening. Same with, you know, it's, it's like, what's that, what's that saying? It's like when you, hold on to sand. If you try to grab sand and you put it in your hand, it's going to all fall out of your hand. You can't reach on to something. You need to have things naturally occur and naturally happen. And I find that a lot with my clients is um, women. I either usually deal with two types of women. I can't, not always, but two types of women when dating around, you know, the biological clock age where they feel the pressures and they want to find somebody. And it's either that a they're dating the same type of man over and over again, just in different forms. You know, they're not really clear on what they want, what type of man they want. You know, they're going for the guy who goes out every Friday night and is like the life of the party. But is that really going to serve you in your future? Is that actually what you want? Why are you attracted to that type of guy? Or there's the other type of women who goes for somebody And they lower their standards so hard because they want it so bad. And they laser focus so hard on a man because they're like, okay, wait, he could be my husband. He could be this, he could be that. And after the second date, you're like Googling every single thing about him, his LinkedIn, his Instagram, his Facebook, maybe thinking, maybe envisioning what your wedding would be like. And you get, you're getting too excited and it can scare off men a bit. So yeah, it's, it's definitely different, different types of emotions and feelings that come into play um, when you feel those pressures from society. And I just really want to help women um, 
be okay with just being whole on your own because that's when you can create your self-confidence and nothing is more attractive in a woman than self-confidence. Mm -hmm. And that's done through the inner work so inner that work. it shines through and reflects on the outside as well. For sure. Yeah. My program is my do you boo program is basically, so I do help women when I'm coaching them. Like I will help them throughout their dating journey. If they're doing online coaching, I oh, was sorry, online dating, they want coaching throughout that journey. But my do you boo program is essentially dealing with women that have faced dating burnout and you're taking a complete step away from dating. So it's an eight week program one-on-one -on -one with me where I, you, you don't, you're not dating. <laughs> we are rewiring you. You're having a clean slate and we're going to work through what wasn't working before and what you really want in life. Because if we're forcing the issue and we're trying to do it on a societal timeline um, and we're trying to do inner work while we're forcing the issue, it's not going to come together the way that we want it to. No, it's not going to. And you know, for me personally, also when I was dating, I, went through a bit of a, a phase where I tried to push it. And I, I remember one time, one week I went on three dates and it, it wasn't like, they're just meet and greets, you know, you're just going for like a cocktail or whatever. But I was like, what am I doing? Like, why am I trying to fulfill this void? Take a step back. Like, let's cut off all dating and let's do some me time here. And that's what I did. And months later, I, I actually am in a really healthy and happy relationship right now. So it's great because you eliminated some distractions that were taking away from the priority, which is yourself. Exactly. Exactly. You can't be, you can't be in a happy, healthy relationship if you're not happy and healthy yourself. Yeah. That would be the definition of filling a void. And that's exactly. certainly why it doesn't work. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you find a connection between your, your work in the social work area area with the domestic violence and the current people that you work with now? Um, I, I do have some um, client, clients that have faced, maybe not necessarily as extreme as the government, uh, because in the government it was, you know, I was dealing with a lot of people from lower socioeconomic fa environments and it was very, um, it was a different type of, you know, clientele per se, but certain types of behaviors for sure. Um, because, you know, abuse isn't just, you know, physical violence. Abuse can be verbal abuse, mental abuse. Um, it doesn't, it's not just somebody physically, you know, abusing you every single day. So certain patterns that I do like to help women um, get over or, or, or actually not, not get over, but understand them. Because when you're in a situation, an abusive, situ abusive situation, you don't usually necessarily know it's even abuse sometimes. You're so used to it that you think that it's normal. So somebody, you know, belittling you or, or calling you, you know, names or manipulating you or, you know, gaslighting, whatever it is, it's, you're used to it. So it's almost like letting them discover A is this healthy and should you be in this any longer? Because mm -hmm. it's not like an instantaneous switch. It's a slow progression of the buildup of abuse, whether that be emotional or verbal. For sure. I mean, the cycle of violence uh, theory in, in what was it developed in 1979? Basically, it's not abuse isn't stagnant. It's not constant, right? So, if somebody was to abuse you every single day, so say you know you come home and someone punches you in the face, guy or girl, because abuse can be against men too, right? Guy or girl, you come home, they punch you in the face. Day one, day two, they punch you in the face. Day three, day four, day five. After the fifth day, you're going to leave. You're going to be like, I don't want to be punched in the face. But abuse isn't, you know, constant like that. It's basically you get punched in the face and then the next day they buy you flowers and they say, they're sorry, they're going to change. And then three weeks down the road, it happens again. And then they say, oh no, I'm going to change. So it's this constant cycle of you're holding on to the hope that the person's going to change. And that's why people go back. And that's why it's, you know, a cycle of abuse, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, with, um, with that inner work that's so necessary to break any cycle or any pattern that we're repeating, where does self-acceptance and acceptance from others fall into place for you and your clients? Self-acceptance um, and self-acceptance from others. I think it comes from self-acceptance for yourself. It's just coming to terms with, if you're leaving abuse or if you've left abuse, is just coming to terms with 
what happened, the choices you made and forgiving yourself. You know, a lot of it comes from forgiving yourself. Um, and we hold on to these feelings of not accepting what happened because we haven't forgiven ourselves. You know, a lot of with abuse, there's a lot of blaming, a lot of manipulation, um, a lot of feelings that, you know, I'm not, not trusting yourself. So I feel like in order for you to accept, accept it, you need to trust yourself again. Because in situations where there's any type of, you know, infidelity or cheating or, or abuse or trauma, we lose the trust we have within ourselves. And that's hard to get back sometimes. You trust, okay, wait, how did I not see the red flags? How did I not see the warning signs? How did I put up with that? How, how was I okay with that? And you lose this disconnection between, you know, who you are and what you actually allowed yourself to go through. Um, so getting that acceptance is getting that trust within yourself and doing the work and spending the time and allowing the people around you. Because a lot of my clients or clients in past situations um, is that, you know, when you are in a business situation, sometimes you cut off a lot of friends and family. You know, you cut off a lot of relationships, a lot of relationships can end because of it. So it's about putting yourself back out there and explaining it or and letting people understand what you went through and, sh and sharing a bit of your story if you can. Mm -hmm. And rebuilding the trust for yourself within yourself has a lot to do with setting new, healthier boundaries. For sure. Yeah. Which ones are at the top of your priority list to help uh, your clients do some deep inner work? Set boundaries. Which boundaries? Yeah. I would say boundaries in terms of intimate boundaries, communication boundaries, um, and life goal boundaries, because I feel like a common pattern can be, or has been, is you're not really specific on what you want in life and a lot. And sometimes in abusive or controlling situations, it's imposed other people's values and goals on your life. And you kind of mold to that. Whereas if you're very clear on what you want, what you don't want going forward in your future, you know, that comes into play. No, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to do this. And you can really, you know, make a, a, a solid plan on what you want going forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And part of that inner work and part of that realization that it was an abusive situation can come from, um, What am I trying to say here? <laughs> um, I lost my train of thought, but we'll come back to it. Okay. okay. Sounds good. <laughs> and on a lighter note, mm -hmm. um, when somebody starts to progress past all that deep inner uh, challenging work, what do they find on the other side? So all the deep challenging work. So when they when they have overcome um, any type of past trauma or, you know, leaving an abusive situation or restarting their life is they start to develop an empowering feeling, a feeling of, wait a second, I can do this. I have done this. I can overcome it. And seeing people progress past that is a beautiful thing. Seeing somebody in the beginning stages being meek and not knowing, you know, what to do or what the next steps are to, basically blooming into a beautiful human being with, in, with confidence and, you know, ready to take on the world is, is a beautiful thing. So that's what I've seen women progress to when they come out of that and actually do the work and, and find, you know, what they want in life, get clear in their boundaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like uh, they just completely rebuilt that attractive quality of confidence when they come out of that. Exactly. Exactly. The confidence. Yeah. For sure. They begin to exude and they begin to shine uh, mm -hmm. beyond their wildest dreams. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and confidence is, is the most, I mean, I actually posted a blog post today about being self-confident um, and dating in 2020 for women. And, you know, nothing, confidence is shown in like your body language. It's, you can tell a confident person the minute they walk into a room right? As opposed to somebody who's not looking on the ground, their body language or mannerisms and what, right? I always tell my clients, it's no different than like an acting audition for me. When I think of acting auditions, when you really, really, really want the acting role, you know, or you really, really want a job interview or a job and you're like, Hey, I really want this. It, it makes people pull away. It's the people in acting auditions that would be like, okay, line, 
line, please. Yeah. All right. What did you say, Joe? Like that kind of thing. It's a body language. It's how you, you show yourself. So I always tell um, my clients when going into dates, it's about confidence. It's not about, you know, this, 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 you could, it's not necessarily even about how great you appear, obviously put like, you know, put value into how you're presenting yourself, but it's about your body language, your eye contact, how you're talking, you know, and basically having the thought that if this goes great, or if it doesn't go great, I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Open-minded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unattached to the outcome of meeting somebody new. You said you went on three dates in one week. They were meeting. <laughs> yes. <your> oh yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you were very attached to the outcome from any one of the three. Is that right? No, no. I mean, I, I'm a pretty uh, extroverted person. Like I can have conversations and I think I thought of it more as like a conversation, meet and greet, let's talk and see what's going on. Um, but I remember after the third date that week, I was sitting there and I was like, I wish, that was a really bad thought to have, but I said, I'm like, I wish I could record my voice and press a button to explain exactly what I do and how my day was and this and that. I'm like, okay, if I'm thinking this, this is not fair. Why am I going on these dates? You're just trying to fill the avoid, fill time. These aren't serving you. These aren't serving the people you're going on dates with. So just cut it out, you know? So yeah, I learned a lot from that too. The dating, I learned a lot as well. So you kind of felt like a broken record in that week and uh, the small talk started to wear on you and you got a little burnout. Yeah. The dating, dating burnout, it's, it's a thing, right? You know, especially with the online dating, you know, it's like, I actually have a blog post I'm going to be posting in a couple of weeks, but it's the four stages of online dating. And it's like, when you first get it, you're like, yeah, I got online dating. <laughs> like, Okay. Back and forth, back and forth, get the attention. Second stage, you're like, okay, this is like a little bit, this is a lot of work. There's a lot of people messaging me. And then the third stage, you go on a couple of dates, you get a little bit cynical, a little bit jaded. And you're like, I don't want to do this. And then you stop talking to people. Then you're like, wait a second. They're not really responding to me. No one's messaging me. So you go back on it, <laughs> go back and forth. And then the fourth stage, you're like, I'm done. You delete the app. And then there is a fifth stage because you end up re-downloading it months later. So it's, it, it's dating burnout is definitely a thing. And it doesn't have to be a thing if you do online dating more strategically and don't, you know, make it all like a free for all type of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. What kind of simple strategies would you put in place to prevent burnout if you're dating online? So I actually have a, a free course. It's called the three mistakes women make when doing online dating. It's a quick video series. It's on my website. Um, but what I say is don't, first of all, women tend to, I, I know for a fact, a lot of my clients can tend to laser focus and date online monogamously, right? So they can tend to meet one guy and, and, and really laser focus on him when online dating is meant as a tool to really just get yourself out there. It's meant to be a little bit more casual to, you know, have conversations, go on a date, go in there. Don't get so laser focused on one person. Um, so to not get dating burnout is I wouldn't suggest going on three dates with three different people in one week. <laughs> That's number one. <laughs> Definitely don't do that. Um, but pick and choose who your, who your dates are. You know, don't go, don't decide to just go with this person, this, this person, that person, take your time and make a plan for yourself. Be like, okay, maybe I'm going to go, I'm going to go on two dates this month with two different people if it works out well. And that's it. That's my max. You know, you're not laser focused on one person at that time. You can still have conversations with other people, you know, through the app, but to actually physically meet somebody in person two, that's it. No more than two or one or whatever it needs to be for your, you know, for what you want, but set those boundaries on yourself so that you're not like, okay, date, 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 this, 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 and also set boundaries on, you know, when you're going to talk to the person on the app. You know, sometimes I had, I've had clients during the day and they're, you know, doing emails and responding and doing emails and responding. And it's like, why don't you just maybe focus on work and deal with dating app later, deal with it between these hours, go on the app between, you know, six to nine and not, you know, nine to nine, <laughs> those type of boundaries, be very strict on how often you're using the app on how many dates you're going to go on and on who you're really talking to. Right have like, be, and also being very clear on your deal breakers is a big thing too, because a lot of people can go to do online dating. They're like, okay, I don't really have to know my total deal breakers until I go on the physical dates. And that's not really true because you're still investing your time and your energy talking to somebody on an app. 
So know what your deal breakers are. If you're looking at his profile or her profile for that matter, and you're like, I don't like the, I don't like, I don't really like that about the person, then don't give them a chance. You know, if that's one of your strong deal breakers, if, you know, say their occupation is an actor and you're like, I don't want to date, I don't want to date somebody in film. I don't want to do that. I'm not, I'm, I, it's not, it's not for me. Then why carry on a conversation with them? If their profile picture looks great, great. It's probably because it probably does because they're an actor, but like then just cut it off. Right. So being very clear on your deal breakers and boundaries when doing online dating will really help you not get to dating burnout. Mm -hmm. I can get on board with that. That's a pretty quick, simple strategy. And I, I ponder this quite a bit and I've got the time, you know, like yeah. <laughs> uh, the gym shut down about a month ago. And ever since, you know, I've been working on my online programs, but Mm -hmm. um, but also loving recording the podcast and actually devoting time to it because uh, it's one of my favorite things. So as I was poking around, learning more about myself through um, not dating currently, uh, which yeah. is a good timing for me. But I actually wrote down something that would support what you were talking about is uh, you're exercising your options when you're speaking to more than one person. Mm -hmm. And when you find somebody you like, you may focus on that person. Um, to kind of raise your standards and keep your value high in that other person's um, first impression of you. And mm -hmm. I think a, a good helpful hint is that narrowing down the time that you use the app or respond to messages between certain hours of the day so you can focus entirely on what you've got going on in your priorities. For sure, yeah. Being very clear on it because I mean, it's so easy in this day and age to like be on the app 24 seven, it's on your phone. Right. But just be very strict on it because you know, you need to have your, it, it's when you start to really laser focus on one person, you're waking up, you're like, Oh, did he message me? Or did she message me or whatever? You need to get out of that mind space. Right. And when you're on it that much, you have this expectation, this anticipation, you just let it go using it from six to nine, whatever your hours are it frees up your time to really focus on yourself and not be over analyzing or thinking about the person online that you haven't met yet, you know? <laughs> and when you do that, you, you tend to raise your own um, vibrational level. Um, for sure. And you exude that confidence once again. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can carry that with you into every arena of your life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah not just dating, confidence in business, confidence in relationships and in, in, in anything, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I think that um, I want to circle back and talk about that first stage of online dating that you're going to write about here pretty soon. But uh, you kind of mentioned attention there. It feels good to get attention in that first stage. Yeah, because if you've, if you've never done online dating, right? So if you're like completely, you know, a novice to it, you do online dating, you're like, wow, wait a second. Like all these people are messaging me. Right. Because when you're single, you know, it, sometimes you can, it can be a lonely time sometimes. Right. And I'm not sure how it is where in Denver, but in Vancouver, the dating scene or people, people have been told when you're single here that men don't approach women here. <laughs> it's like a common saying that a lot of my clients have said in Vancouver, men don't approach them here. Like you go to Europe, you go to parts of the States, men will approach you. Vancouver, they don't. I mean, I think that's true sometimes, but I do see, I have seen the pattern myself. And so when you do online dating, all of a sudden you're like, wait, wait a second, Tim 82 is messaging me. And you know, Thomas over there is saying, I look pretty in my picture or whatever it is. And you get this attention and you're like, great, wow. And it feels good because you're not necessarily getting that attention from your significant other because you don't have one. Right. So you're, it's filling a bit of a void, you know, and you're like, oh, awesome. I'm getting this. They like, you know, they're, they're interested in what I do, this, 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 but with the first stage that dies down because, you know, a lot of those initial messages don't really carry out to be full on actually good conversations. So you have to respond to these to actually do the work to find somebody authentic or that is really wanting the same things as you do uh, in your dating, in your dating life. And that's why you mentioned in stage two, it starts to feel like a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, wow. Okay. And you know, the conversations of having to, you know, but go back and forth. How's your day? This, 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 this. And you know, sometimes people, I experienced it myself where people actually do copy and paste messages into 
the apps, right? I know firsthand because I was talking to somebody and it was, uh, it was spring. It was not snowing. And the message was like, came back and it was like, oh, the roads in Vancouver though, or something at the end. I was like, what is he talking about? I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, she just copy and pasted a message to me. So yeah, it's, it's a bit of work, right? It's a bit of work for sure. But, um, you have to put in the work to actually do find somebody, you know, that is worthwhile to go on the physical date, physical in person date with. And then you never know, it can transpire something amazing. I know I do have a lot of clients and women that I've met online and, and they're happy in happy committed relationships now. And that has a lot to do with timing of two individuals coming together with an intention of connecting authentically with another to build something real. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, I mean, timing, communication, and both wanting the same thing, right? Because you, you can go on online dating and someone can say, oh yeah, looking for, you know, long-term relationship. And then you go on a couple of dates with them and they, you know, they're not, you know, they maybe they're looking to just, you know, have a person to hook up with or, or whatever their situation is. Sometimes people aren't obviously authentic or real on the dating apps, right? It's just part of the game. Mm-hmm. I think that a lot of people could relate to that where, um, people might be hiding behind the app or maybe misrepresenting themselves uh, to get what they want, to say whatever it is that they want to, to get that instant gratification of either the attention or um, possible hookup. And sure. that could, that could lead to frustration. I can, I can see it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've, I've, for some of my clients have dealt with situations where, you know, maybe somebody doesn't want to be, um, you know, they want an open relationship or, or things like that. And it's not really clear because people don't really advertise that necessarily on a dating app. So then you go on a couple of dates, you, you invest the time and you're like, oh, okay, wait a second. Right. Or, you know, differences, or sometimes people, um, won't, you know, say they have children on there and that's okay. But, you know, sometimes that could be a deal breaker for someone going forward. Right. So mm -hmm. you can't expect people to be completely transparent on a dating app. Um, but going forward in the actual physical dates, you'd expect them to tr to obviously be authentic and more transparent as the dates go on, right? Sure, absolutely. How how much information can we give in 140 or 200 characters or less? Exactly, exactly, yeah. That's certainly not gonna tell my entire story uh, through three prompts and five photographs. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. I've had people though in certain, certain uh, circumstances um, so someone finds you in a dating app and then if they somehow can look like you say you have not a unique first name or, you know, you don't put your last name there, but they find you on your social media. Oh, and then they start following you on your social media and your Facebook without even really meeting you. And they start to get to know you that way. And I've had that happen with some of my clients as well. They're like, is this weird? And I'm like, well, do you think it's weird <laughs> that someone is doing this? Like, are you okay with this? I personally would think that's a little bit too much if you haven't met somebody in real life and they're already, you know, creeping all of your, looking all of your stuff up. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously social boundaries and social norms. Um, but yeah, so people, I tend to, uh, people, I've had that experience as well with clients where people do that as well, right? Yeah, it's totally relatable. Um, let's use Hinge, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you can choose to put your last name or not. And yeah. I would, I would consider it more common for people to uh, dig a little deeper if your last name is there mm -hmm. and um, if people can connect their Instagram account to both uh, yes. Twitter, Hinge, Bumble. I know that those are all three able to do that. So it's a great way, I believe, to kind of uh, sift through people who are not for you. Mm -hmm. um, if you choose to connect their uh, Instagram account or give out their Instagram handle. Mm -hmm. And it's an invitation to look a little bit further uh, mm -hmm. to see if it's the right fit. And I, I remember a time when uh, that was the case, you know, match with somebody and they provided their Instagram handle. So, all right, jump on over to Instagram and learn a little bit more. Yeah. And there were a few pictures that were a little bit too recent with the X still in the uh, okay. Instagram feed. Yeah. So, I can appreciate that type of investigation on both sides mm -hmm. and that kind of transparency from the person who offers up their Instagram handle too. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, with, with the whole Instagram thing, like I personally would never link my Instagram to it. I just feel like, I feel like with, when you have your social media linked to that, people can place judgment without really getting to know the person. Right. 
So you could be like, okay, well, he had a shirtless selfie. Like what's his, you know, (laughs) things like that. And you're kind of already like placing these judgments on somebody without even meeting them in real life. And you could actually maybe be missing out on somebody great in saying that though, with your you know situation with the ex, that would strike me as a bit of a, you know, if it was like a picture from a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, no. If it's a picture from maybe like, you know, a year ago, you didn't delete. All right. You know what I mean? So yeah, for sure. But it is a good way to investigate further and, and kind of, you know, protect yourself in a way, right. And not waste your time. Absolutely. That transparency goes a long way to, um, to definitely sift out people who are not for you. Mm-hmm. And, um, I'm a pretty intense person and my Instagram, uh, account definitely reflects that with, uh, predominantly jujitsu and weightlifting and mm-hmm. my daughter's on there too. And my dog, of course, you know, those are the four most common <laughs> posts on Instagram. And if, and if you don't want to be a part of that, that's totally okay. Um, yeah. I choose to link my Instagram account. I choose to put my last name in an app like mm-hmm. him so that, you know, I host a podcast for authentic dating. I <laughs> go ahead. Like, yeah. Google my name. You're going uh, <laughs> to come up with a lot of images and a lot of blog posts <laughs> that's attached to my name. And that's totally okay. I think you're going to get all, I think when you were dating, you definitely would be getting more authentic daters then, right? <laughs> It's the laws of attraction that I'm, what you put out there will come back to you. (laughs) Yes, for sure. (laughs) I get this question a lot of like, oh, are you on this date for research? Okay. I could see that. I could Mm -hmm. see that. Yeah. I had that question when I told them I was on a date one time. I said I was a life coach and they said, well, well, do you like, are you thinking about what I'm thinking? What you're thinking right now? I'm like, what? What what do you mean? (laughs) Like, I'm on a date drinking a glass of wine with you. But yeah, yeah, it's funny when people kind of think that your uh, your work is coming into the into the dating as well, right? Mm -hmm. It comes back to that first investigation of of the person you're interested in or the person you match with on their Instagram account, and the four agreements. We were just talking about it with Carrie Ann from Brazil. You and I were Mm -hmm. talking briefly about her before we started, but. Uh, she's a big fan of the four agreements and one of them is don't make assumptions. Yeah. So if we come across somebody's Instagram account and we're investigating a little bit further and we're like making snap judgments, Mm -hmm. we can come back to something that we've learned along the way, like the four agreements and say, all right, I will choose to give them the benefit of the doubt for now. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe the X uh, picture is still up there from a year ago is not a deal breaker because it shouldn't Mm -hmm. be, Mm -hmm. you know, that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. it gives you a little bit more opportunity to ask curious questions of like, when did, uh, when did your last relationship end? How did it end? Mm -hmm. These are totally appropriate questions to go a little bit further than just making assumptions on the Instagram account. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And you know, not making assumptions is, I like to instill that a lot of my clients as well, because sometimes getting back to date women, dating the same person, in different forms, sometimes, you know, you really need to go outside of what you actually think you want, because what you think you want isn't necessarily what you actually need. Right. In my current situation, um, my, my boyfriend's amazing. He, when we actually talk about it, we're completely, completely not each other's type at all. And it works so well. And it's, it's really funny when we talk about it. He's like, I never thought, I'm like, I never thought, <laughs> but it's, it's working. So uh, sometimes it's not having those assumptions that actually gets you to a really fulfilled relationship. Yeah. Because if you guys are in a position to call each other forth and he's yeah. not your normal type, then you're going to be experiencing something that's unfamiliar and actually exciting once again. Yeah. And if you can compliment each other on those, on your differences, if you, if the differences are, are not too different, that they complement each other, that's when it will work. If the differences are way too different or your values are different, your morals are different, all of that, obviously not going to work. But if the differences are different, just enough, it, it tends to actually create a really good, passionful, healthy relationship. Mm-hmm. Because we have compassion and grace for our partner Uh, we have the opportunity to support them because they're still an individual when they come to the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can, we can support them from the, from behind the scenes and say, Hey, way to go on that deal at work. Congratulations on uh, your cousin's marriage. You know, 
things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, for sure. Well, I know that your time is valuable. Um, if there's one thing that um, stands out to our audience and they want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? The best way to do that is going to my website. It's shannachow.com. Or you can also find me on Instagram. I have two Instagram accounts. My one for dating and relationships is Shanna underscore Chow. Or my writing account for my books is Shanna M. Chow. Um, and yeah, I'm also on YouTube as well. I have a blog post on Medium. Check it out. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Medium. Um, that's, uh, I was speaking in my memoir earlier. I, I chose not to publish my book um, okay. for a lot of reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. Authors may not actually have the intention to make money off of their book. And it's really just a, a compliment to their business and mm -hmm. to help um, give credibility and to kind of reach new people. Well, we can do that on an app called Medium in the same way as if we were to sell our book. For sure, yeah. And I chose to put my entire memoir available on Medium. And wow. I've, I've just absolutely loved how it reads like Kindle and it's super easy. They're almost like swiping left on a dating yeah. app. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if there's one thing that you want to leave us with today that we didn't get to or that we just briefly touched on and you want to give us a little bit more uh, deep dive, what would that be? Um, I can end with a poem from one of my books. It's actually one of my favorite poems from my book. It's from page 231. Of I, uh, I tried to write love poems. It's my book I published in 2019. And it goes like this. Take the chance, the heart said. If I get broken again, I'll find a way to get fixed again. Simple. Well said. Thank you. And I know that we didn't get a chance to talk about the Enneagram. Have you heard of it before we, uh, before we met? I did. Um, I did. I did the test a couple years ago and then I kind of forgot which one I was. So I redid it after email and I'm number three, the achiever. And what resonated with you? What stood out when you um, read a little bit further into it? Oh, a lot. Pretty much everything, um, but in particular, just thinking about my upbringing with my parents, I always wanted to impress them. I always wanted to do really well in school and do really well in my courses and, you know, sports teams, this, this. I always wanted to achieve. It was always the next thing. And that's played really, you know, strongly into my person, into my adulthood as well. I always want to do the next thing and do the best at it. I could, I could hear that a little bit in the language when we were getting to know each other. Yeah. Um, very, uh, the achiever loves, um, loves to perform mm -hmm. and loves to show up that way. And absolutely in your family dynamics growing up, that's what solidifies our personality type through the Enneagram. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So generally, that. generally really good grades, really good athletes. Um, what's <laughs> next? On to the next. What's the next level? Yeah. How do you sure. see that showing up in your in your adult life? Uh, in my adult life is I always want to have something I'm working towards, right? So like, for example, last spring, summer, it was about having my second book published and out there. Um, you know, within the last months here, it's about relaunching the business and getting more clients on board and growing my Facebook group and, and all of that. So I always constantly feel like I need a goal. <laughs> I need something I'm working towards, right? And if I don't have something, I feel a little bit of dis disconnect. I don't feel, you know, really completely fulfilled. I need to always be working towards something. So it can be a bit of a double-edged sword because I can be like, wow, like I'm, I'm achieving. But if I don't have something, then I feel a little bit lost. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how it definitely plays into my adulthood. And, and how about your relationship? Do you see that uh, same kind of um, attitude, that zest for accomplishment coming into your relationship too? For sure. Yeah. I like to always see us going, you know, progressing, going to the next level, but I don't, I don't push it too hard. Um, I feel like though in my current relationship that we both are, I don't, I don't know his actual, I don't know his type, but I know that we're both pretty much in line with um, achieving things together. So he's a really big achiever himself. He's a really big goal, goal getter, really motivating as well. So we work well together in that. So it's not, um, it's not a detraction. It doesn't um, intrude in our relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I love chatting with couples about the Enneagram because it gives us a, a new lens to see things through and the, 
the compatibility and how we can kind of raise our vibration together and set For goals sure. together. Yeah, yeah. It gives us a common language. I'd be curious to understand what his type was. Me too. I'm going to get him to do this. <laughs> I'm going to get him to do the test. <laughs> yeah. And it can be a lot of fun too. Um, for me, the Enneagram was the key to self-awareness and personal growth. And it, it's been a tool I've used for well over three years now um, and implemented on the daily. Okay, why did, why did I show up like that? Why did I... Why did I make that choice? Why did I use that language? And it comes from the Enneagram for me. Yeah, that's interesting. It's so interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you once again. Um, what do you say we jump on a Facebook Live or uh, we follow up in the next six months? And Sure, really for sure. Thank you so much for having me. I am honored to be on your show and I'm really looking forward to listening to it when it's live. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Shannon. Okay, thank you. Bye.